Over the last four classes, we've been considering the principle of divine headships, and particularly the ecclesial age ritual designed to be a physical expression of this heavenly principle, and how this was a gender-focused ritual. Brethren were commanded never to cover their heads while either praying or miraculously prophesying, and sisters were commanded to always cover their heads whenever miraculously prophesying or praying. We considered God's pattern of a two-stage spiritual service structure that was evident in the last divine dispensation between the priests and the Levites and is re the required pattern today during the ecclesial age with brethren performing priest-like duties and sisters performing Levite-like support duties, as well as in the restored kingdom age about to be established when there will be both immortal priests and mortal priests. We considered how this two-stage spiritual service structure should be respected, as the number two is both scripturally and creationally demonstrated to represent spiritual balance. If we eliminated one of the always two categories of divine principle, then we imbalance, automatically imbalance our understandings about God's righteousness, jeopardizing our hopeful approval by Jesus Christ if we elevate our respect of the serpent principle of equality above this two-stage service structure, as the Levites tried to do when they were following Korah. Uh, then our relationship to God and his prospective approval are at considerable risk. Now, we've been progressing through 10 questions in relation to this head covering and uncovering gender-based ritual. We have four questions remaining, though we have already had to address some of these issues, as absolutely nothing in God's two witness testimonies independent from everything else. Now, this is certainly the case with question number seven. What are the glory identifications in this commandment, this ritual explanation, and their relationships in this ritual? There's a theme running through the directions and the justifications for this head covering and uncovering gender-based ritual that centers on glory and honor. After Paul mandates that the Ecclesia keep the ordinances as he delivered them, he leads with these four descending headships. Again, God being the head of Christ, who is the head of man, who is the head of woman. Paul provides the directions for physically respecting this headship hierarchy, referencing such issues as honor, dishonor, shame, and glory. He explains how a brother or sister refusing to comply with these directions will dishonor their immediate head, whether that be Christ or man. However, any dishonor to this headship hierarchy is also going to dishonor the author of this headship hierarchy, which is God. And it's never wise to dishonor the creator of heaven and earth. A part of Paul's justifications for this gender-based ecclesial age ritual is this issue of glory. Let's just review um, verses 7 through 10 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians 11 again. Uh, for a man indeed ought not to, to cover his... Oh, I'm sorry. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For it is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power or authority or a covering on her head. 
Glory is basically a de degree of respect, <laughs> but more of an exceptional level of respect. But glory can also be shared. For example, the wife of a husband who excels at something, whether it's academics or business or sports or whatever, shares her husband's glory and to a lesser degree those related to him, such as children and parents. We have um, considered this divine principle before several times. It is the principle of extended benefit. It's the very basis of the salvation of the saints, as Jesus is the only one who will ever have deserved salvation. But God has offered to extend the perfect acceptability of his Son to others, those who his Son will particularly choose as his eternal companions, so that he won't have to be alone. Because as God declared at creation, it is not good that man should be alone. That principle of extended benefit is why God saved Lot out of Sodom, because of Abraham, as we're told in Genesis 19. It's why the children of a single believing parent are considered holy to God. And it's why wives and daughters could partake of the Passover meal, despite not satisfying the absolute requirement to be circumcised. So there's not only a descending headship hierarchy to be recognized and respected, there's a corresponding level of glory assignments to these headships that have to be recognized through humility and meekness. So let's first establish that, that ultimate glory application, which is identified with our Creator. We have to be familiar with the, the prophecies of how God's glory will fill the earth or, or we have no right to be baptized. God was severely disrespected by the enlightened community at Sinai when they responded so, so cowardly to the reports of the ten spies. They rejected the promised land, preferring to return to slavery in Egypt. God threatened to kill them and make a great nation from just Moses. And Moses prayed to God, to forgive them. God agreed, but then made this statement in Numbers 14. Uh, and the Lord said, I've pardoned according to your word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now, we should understand, God's glory is already covering the earth, but it's invisible to the huge majority of mankind, only evident to those who look for it correctly and develop those rare seeing eyes. That divine glory covering the earth isn't really the issue. As we've noted, all of creation, that spoken word of God, testifies concerning divine truths and principles, validating the written testimony of our Creator. This issue is that God's glory is actually going to be recognized by everyone on the earth, even the most obstinate and spiritually blind. Everyone will witness the unveiled glory of God. But, like the invariable pattern, this unveiling will be accomplished in two stages. The first stage is about to begin with the introduction of the second kingdom age in that seventh divine day, which is, which is going to eventually extend all over the world. Uh, those four sin icons of the serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan are going to be chained in the bottomless pit on the basis of kingdom law that will extend all over the planet to every nation, every people, every language, every kindred. This restraining of sin will result in dramatic changes in the creation order and operating structure. There will be a globally recognized glory 
assigned to our Creator. Uh, that will primarily be the result of fear. But there will be a second stage in the unveiling of God's glory that will come after the kingdom has expired, as it says in Revelation 20, in that eighth divine day, when sin is not simply restrained, but completely eliminated. Paul was one of the two apostles to be given visions of this last stage in the Creator's plan beyond the elimination of death, his visions of the third heaven. John, of course, was the other apostle who heard the testimony of the seven thunders concerning when time would no longer exist. Um, both Paul and John were forbidden to share their visions of that final stage in the unveiling of God's glory. Uh, Paul describes this time as when God will be all in all. That second unveiling stage of God's glory is beyond our capacity to even imagine, and it will have nothing to do with fear. But it is the seventh millennium when God's glory will be shared by Christ, and Christ will share that glory with the saints who will enjoy vindication and justice and be respected and glorified by all the mortals who survived the events surrounding the introduction of the second kingdom of God. There's a descending order for sharing this glory of the Creator and Jesus as God's Son, as His perfect representative. Um, Jesus will enjoy a glory that's greater than the saints. He's both high priest and king. <laughs> Interestingly, however, in Ezekiel's prophecy of the Millennial Kingdom, Jesus is referred to as the Prince. And this is because the ultimate king is his father, Yahweh. But Jesus is also described in Revelation 19 as the King of Kings and inherits the throne of his uh, father David. And this is because of the shared glory with the saints. He's the King of Kings. And that glory of his will be shared with the kings he appoints, who are going to serve as kings and priests and reign over the earth for a thousand years, as we're told in Revelation 5 and 10. God and Christ and the saints all share this single title of king. But the degrees of glory are not equal. Equality is a serpent principle, not a divine principle. Therefore, these headships being validated by the ecclesial age ritual of head coverings and uncoverings also share a descending level of glory that shares a common source, being God's glory. Now, let's understand how it is that the unenlightened do not witness this earth-saturating glory that is now available, but being veiled. This recognition will offer an insight into the basis for how these descending glory assignments of these four headships can be so disrespected by non-compliance for this head covering and uncovering ritual in our enlightened community today. As I hope we've learned over the course of these considerations about understanding God's righteousness, there are only two gods available to worship at any time in the plan of God in any place on earth. Now, there is Yahweh, our creator, and there is the reflection in the mirror. Every form of false doctrine is based entirely on self-worship. That mirror God has an endless list of names but it's always the same God, whether that false God is called Baal, uh, Marduk, Ra, Ishtar, Brahma, Buddha, Zeus, Jupiter, uh, God the Father, God the Son, as, as the uh, Trinitarians refer to him, that God, and, and, and so on and so on. These are all gods invented from the serpent-based imaginations of the uncircumcised human heart. Every 
single form of unenlightened religion, including the religion of evolution, is simply self-worship. That universally present glory of our Creator is invisible, as most people cannot see beyond their own reflection. It's like the surface of a pond on a sunny day. Uh, we read in Scripture about how the Word of God is, is like water, the water of the Word. Well, if we look down into a calm body of water on a bright sunny day, we don't really see beyond the surface. We only see our own reflection. I remember this from my youth. My, my, my favorite place on our family farm was a, was a little tiny pond down the laneway where an underground stream surfaced briefly uh, to make a home for a, for a lot of leopard frogs. And these were my involuntary playmates as I would try to stealthily uh, spot them in the grass or the rocks and, and catch them before they could dive into the water. And I couldn't spot them, uh, but only see my own reflection on the surface. If we want to witness the veiled glory of God before it becomes mandatory in the whole world, then we have to get past our own significance. We have to get past our own presumptuous glory. This is the challenge in determining how, why, and when to apply the ritual of head coverings during prayers for sisters and uncovered heads for brethren during prayers. Historically, the challenge has centered on the glory of the sisters, that this glory should not be covered except in the most minimal of circumstances, with the most minimal of head coverings, and for the least amount of time possible. The defense for this frame of reference is the principle of equality or the insistence for the significance of competence, as if these issues or personal glory somehow eclipse divine principles. Now here's the glory equation as Paul presents it. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power, authority, covering on her head. So a brother must never pray with an uncovered head due to this glory equation that man was created in the image and glory of God, and certainly projects Jesus Christ, a sister must always pray with a covered head, also due to this glory equation, that woman is the glory of man, just as the ecclesial bride will be the glory of Christ. This is what we read in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, um, in reference to the coming of Jesus when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the glory equation. God is glorified in Christ. Christ is glorified in the saints. But that also serves to glorify God, as Christ is the glory of God. In this dispensation, at this time, Sisters represent the ecclesial bride of Christ, and brothers represent Christ as the bridegroom. Just like Eve, due to the purpose, order, and process of her original creation, she had Adam as her appointed head. So man, and therefore brethren, serves as the divinely appointed head of woman, and therefore sisters on the basis of this divinely appointed glory equation. 
This gender differential appears to change somewhat in the kingdom uh, for the saints. Jesus tells us there will be no marriage or giving in marriage to those who will become like the angels. Uh, in Luke 20, when he answers uh, one of those silly questions designed to embarrass him on, on the 13th of Nisan, just before uh, uh, Passover, when he was to die, uh, they're trying desperately to embarrass him, and the, and the Sadducees present this silly question about the wife with seven brother husbands, and Jesus answers them and, and gives us this information. And Jesus answering said of them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. I remember when I was uh, somewhat younger, I, used to, I actually used to get a little depressed reading this, thinking that my wife will not be my wife upon immortalization. I, I taught myself to just trust God, not get obsessed by what I don't know. We're told, eye has not seen, nor ear, neither, nor ear heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We just need to trust him. But whatever the case, there will be no marriage or giving in marriage for those inherit who inherit the nature of angels. But at this time, in this dispensation, we do have these two, these gender-based rituals of head coverings and silence. These rituals are designed to be physical expressions of heavenly truths. If we object to or refuse to perform the physical shadows in the manner in which God and Christ prescribed, then we are automatically objecting to the eternal divine principles that these shadows extend from. Disrespecting God's glory equation and divine headships is certainly offensive to him and therefore very unwise. Now, we noted last week how a sister veiling her glory in prayer is not just an act of humble acceptance of the divinely appointed headship of man. It's an act demonstrating the principle of God manifestation. God manifestation is all about how God veils his power and his glory by shining it through others. He veils his glory just like a sister does when she approaches God through Christ in prayer, bypassing her God-appointed headship of man. That veiling of personal glory is a godlike demonstration of the absolute foundational principle in what Scripture calls the truth. And we're going to see a similar unique godlikeness capacity in the sisters' silence ritual when we we get to that. Our eighth question, I think, uh, pretty much has been answered in the context of previous considerations. That would be, how does this head covering or head shaving requirement manifest itself in complementary fashion in the lengthening and shortening shadow testimony of God throughout the divine ages? We've reviewed the head covering of the high priest the head shavings of the Nazarite, the war bride, the healed leper. But the only head, other head covering or uncovering ritual application I can think of would be the test for a wife presumed to have been unfaithful. In that procedure, she was required to uncover her head. I also think our ninth question has been addressed over the course of our previous questions. Um, is this ritual so insignificant it can be casually dismissed without consequence, without offending God and Christ, as is so frequently done currently in our community? We've already addressed this issue from a number of different directions. The conclusion is that we should not disrespect the heavenly substance casting this ritual shadow testimony by dismissing the observation 
of this ordinance as Paul refers to it. Our tenth and last question was, how do the sons of men paganize Christianity uh, and even the enlightened community corrupt this divinely appointed ritual? The corruptions of this ritual requirement within the unenlightened community is really not very significant. Just like how the, the other divinely required rituals are corrupted, like, like baby sprinkling instead of baptism, water burial by a mature, compliant, enlightened man or woman, or, or a uh, wafer instead of a broken, instead of broken unleavened bread and wine for memorial service, or just memorial, memorial service only observed once a year, or not at all. The principles of equality and competent effectiveness, which are treasured by the serpent-minded society of the unenlightened community, undermine divine principles and the physical expressions of those heavenly principles. The exaltation of self-glory above God's glory is another corrupting influence. But all of these societal influences are also the foundational problems within the enlightened community's disrespect for the four ecclesial age rituals. These current considerations were prompted by the survey that we first referenced a few weeks ago, documenting a distinct disrespect for Christ's two gender-based rituals of the ecclesial age. Uh, but also documenting an accelerating disrespect. Okay, therefore, let's also consider that second gender-based ecclesial age ritual. This is God's requirement that brethren take the leadership role in ecclesial functions, education, and management. We touched on this in our considerations of how extensive the application was intended to be for brethren and sisters in reference to their respective requirements when praying or prophesying, with the head covered or uncovered. We noted in 1 Corinthians 14 that sisters were to be silent during ecclesial functions, even if they had the capacity to miraculously prophesy. Therefore, it would be completely impossible to presume that the head covering ritual that Paul details in chapter 11 could possibly be limited to ecclesial functions, since sisters weren't even allowed to pray or prophesy in that environment in the first place. So, what about the silence ritual? Paul's primary directions are presented in 1 Timothy 2, um, pick up at verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, gold and pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness, with good works. Let the woman learn in silence, with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity or love and holiness with sobriety. This silence and subjection requirement is justified by Paul in two ways. Uh, first, we have the same justification issue presented in the head covering ritual, the order of creation. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Obviously, this is a very significant issue to God and Christ. As Paul pointed out before, these issues were delivered to him, and he requires the ecclesia to observe these ordinances as he delivered them to everyone, which would include us. But in addition to the order of creation, we have the justification for that first creation corrupting sin. Paul says, uh, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Therefore, sisters who object to this silence ritual are declaring that God made a mistake by making Adam before Eve, and that God made a mistake in his gender judgments in Eden. 
because those are the two justifications that Paul offers for observing this gender-based silence ritual. Competence makes no difference in the world. Subjection is certainly not a component of equality. Therefore, the societal presumption um, uh, of equality is opposed to the terms of God's rightness. Brethren had better step up to the required tasks. It's the brethren's responsibility to project Jesus Christ as the teachers and the administrators of the enlightened community of the Ecclesia. Before we list our, our questions that we're going to need to address, let's just provide some more depth by reviewing Paul's statements about sisters' silence in the context of the Ecclesia, where the Holy Spirit gifts were an avenue of competition in the ecclesial environment in Corinth. We read, um, he progresses from chapter 12, 13, 14, and this issue of the abuse of the Holy Spirit gifts. Chapter 12 is about the, the, uh, uh, the harmony of the ecclesia intended in the various components that all have to be respected. Chapter 13, that, that love is greater than the power of the Holy Spirit and identifies when the Spirit gifts would end. And then chapter 14, he gets very specific um, with absolute commands, and he's, he's closing out his comments as we pick up in verse 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all the ecclesias of the saints, let your women keep silence in the ecclesias, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the ecclesia. What, came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if, if any man be ignorant... Let him be ignorant. So first of all, as we've noted before, the Holy Spirit gifts, such as communicating in multiple languages, prophesying, were not ecstatic. The spirits of the prophets were subject to the prophets, and that's why Paul could require everyone else to remain silent while one brother revealed something by the Spirit and why he could require sisters to always remain silent in all the ecclesias of the saints, whether or not she had uh, a Holy Spirit gift. Sisters are instructed to be under obedience, which is similar to Paul's instructions to Timothy that sisters learn in silence with all subjection. The apostle's emphasis of this silence ritual is evident in how he declares that it's actually shameful for a woman to speak in the ecclesia. Another point of emphasis is how Paul states clearly that everyone should acknowledge these ordinances that he presented were commandments of Jesus Christ, as well as the added emphasis that, well, if any man is, any man is going to be ignorant on these issues, just let him be ignorant. Wow. So, as always, we have questions that we should address. First, why is silence a required ritual? What is it about silence that satisfies the justifications that Paul presents for this gender service differential? Secondly, how does the law declare a woman to be under obedience? Third, how are sisters saved in childbearing? And fourth, is there any teaching responsibility assigned whatsoever to faithful women. So, first of all, why is silence a required ritual? What is it about silence that satisfies the justifications that Paul presents for this uh, gender service differential? Um, after all, um, it's particularly true um, in the creation procedure of man and woman, 
Uh, it's the only, we're the only components in all of creation that God uh, created silently. Um, every other component or placing of a component in the uh, those six days of creation are expressed as being verbally commanded. But man and woman were made in silence, crafted without being commanded into existence. So it's it's an interesting um, frame of reference from the very beginning. So in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, it says, But Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Well, this is the last verse in Habakkuk chapter 2. And of course, there were no chapter divisions in the inspired text. And the immediately next chapter is all about the introduction of the millennial kingdom. Therefore, this statement demanding silence in all the earth in that final verse of chapter 2 has a significant relation to the prophecy of the introduction of the restoration of God's kingdom presented in chapter 3. Now Habakkuk 3 is all about the introduction of the millennial kingdom from the point of the, of the saints being immortalized and the subsequent subjugation of the nations. Parallel prophecies can be found in Deuteronomy 33 and Psalm 68. The detailed prophecy in Habakkuk 3 is definitely about the military application of Christ and the saints following immortalization, with such phrases as driving the nations asunder and the mountains, well, meaning nations, being scattered. The chariots of salvation that God rides upon will be Christ and the saints, as indicated in verse 8. Just as, just in the same sense as the, the cherubim serve as a chariot of God. The cleaving of earth and rivers references the earthquakes that will accompany the destruction of the Gogian host at Jerusalem. Now this phrase about Yahweh being in his holy temple, immediately before this prophecy of the introduction of the millennial kingdom, is actually a reference to the timestamp that God will have immortalized the antitypical temple, which is Christ and the saints. Now, we read about this um, substance uh, casting the temple shadows in Isaiah 66, which immediately follows the prophecy of the millennial kingdom in chapter 65, verses 17 to the end, detailing a number of the wonderful benefits of the millennial kingdom. And in chapter 66, again, immediately following that thought, um, we have the first two verses uh, where God declares what is the place of his true rest will be. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? Where's the place of my rest? Now it should, it should be understood. The temple that Solomon built was still standing. And he's asking this question, where's the house that you build unto me? Where's the place of my rest? For all those things has mine hand made and all those things have been saith the Lord, but to this man will I look. In other words, he'll look for his place of rest. He'll look for that, that antitypical temple. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. God being in his holy temple in that particular context in Habakkuk, is an expression of God inhabiting the substance, casting the shadows of those four temples, of the tabernacle, Solomon's temple, the post-captivity temple, and the final temple that Jesus will construct in the millennial kingdom. This is why Jesus expresses that salvation experience as being mansions or abiding places that he'll prepare in heaven and bring with him to clothe the saints with salvation so that they'll no longer be naked before God. Jesus makes this promise to his disciples at that last Passover meal and has everything 
to do with this statement in Habakkuk 2 about the world had better be silent because God is now inhabiting his holy temple. So John 14, verse uh, 1, uh, Jesus says at the Last Supper to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And then, at that time, he says, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is one of this is one of those supposedly rested scriptures that sadly our community seems to struggle to answer. It's really quite simple. Jesus says he'll bring these mansions made in, uh, prepared in heaven back with him when he returns to receive the faithful unto himself so that they can be where he is, meaning both in nature and in geography upon his return to earth. This salvation process is being described, that's being described here, is elaborated on in verse 23 of the same chapter, where the same Greek word that's translated mansion in verse 2 is translated as abode in verse 23. Um, we read, Judas saith unto him, as they're discussing this at the Passover table, Judas saith to him, not, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. These mansions that Jesus will prepare in heaven and bring back with him when he returns are these abiding places, and God and Christ will abide within the saints. This is the same type of expression as Habakkuk 2 and 20, that Yahweh will be in his holy temple when the immortalized saints will leave Sinai under the leadership of Jesus Christ as that great heavenly army. These mansions, or abiding places, that represent the salvation process are defined as tabernacles made in heaven without hands by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that is intended to clothe the saints so that they'll no longer be naked before God when mortality is swallowed up by life. Of course, that life being eternal life. So in 2 Corinthians 5, we see the same expression that has everything to do with God inhabiting his holy temple and demanding silence in the whole world. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, in other words, if, we, if our body died, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the same thing Jesus refers to as the mansions, the abiding places that he prepares in heaven. So we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, this mortal cursed body, do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, we certainly don't want to die, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So Paul refers to these mansions, these abiding places prepared in heaven and brought back when Christ returns uh, as tabernacles made without hands in heaven. What Habakkuk refers to as God being in his holy temple. Now Paul also calls this, uh, this understanding, our citizenship reserved in heaven. And when Jesus returns from heaven, that citizenship will afford a glorious change in nature. Jesus will take us unto himself that we may be where he is. We see this in Paul's expressions to the Philippians in chapter 3. It says, for our conversation is in heaven. That word conversation is the Greek word polytuma, which basically means in a political affiliation, 
a citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So, this expression that God is in his holy temple, in this particular context of the introduction of the millennial kingdom, when God's silence is an expression of how God will inhabit his eternal, antitypical temple, God, uh, Christ, and those who have trembled at God's words that will serve as the place of his rest in that seventh divine day. Therefore, the silence that's demanded due to the Creator inhabiting the saints is an indication of respect. This is exactly the understanding expressed by Paul in being inspired to demand this gender based silence ritual during the ecclesial age. This expression of silence indicating respect is demonstrated in Jeremiah when the nation of Judah was unrepentant despite their extreme unacceptability uh, to Yahweh during Jeremiah's prof prophetic tenure. Our uh, God intended to silence their arrogant and unwarranted overconfidence and unwillingness to humble themselves before him. We read in Jeremiah 8 that, uh, why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves, let us enter into the defense cities, and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. Silence is a form of respect. that's even recognized by the sons of men uh, the unenlightened, who will impose a moment of silence as an expression of respect and reflection, even at a, a stadium sporting event with tens of thousands of people. Zechariah's, uh, another example of this, Zechariah's imposed silence, the, the father of John the Baptist, was due to his hesitancy to believe. Gabriel's testimony about having a son due to his advanced age of both himself and his wife. His miraculously imposed silence was the divine response to that Levite's disrespectful doubt. We read in Luke 1, um, Behold, the angel says to uh, Zacharias, You shall be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because you believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And dropping down to verse 63, uh, in reference to Zacharias, uh, who did not have the capacity to speak from that time forward, after John is born, and he is asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, his name is John. And they marveled all, and his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt around about them, and all, all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. So we have this silence imposed due to the disrespect of doubt. Now let's make what I... I consider to be a rather fascinating observation about how sisters can be godlike through this silence ritual in a way that brothers cannot. We've reviewed before that God prophesied how the sun would go down over the prophets and there would be an extended drought of the word of God, that there would be no answer from God. And we know this began at the conclusion of those two generations of Jews and Gentiles that were, that were promised the Holy Spirit gifts. We know this because we know exactly when 
God's self-imposed silence will end. Isaiah 42 prophesies in very clear and unmistakable terms that God will end his self-imposed silence dramatically at the introduction of the millennial kingdom, that he will have held his peace and refrain himself for a long time. But at that time, he'll go forth like a, like a charging soldier and cry out like a woman giving birth. The prophecy of that second immortalization in God's plan, as presented in Hosea 6, references two prophetic timestamps of the early and the latter reigns and the dawning of a new day. Therefore, the ending of the prophecies about the sun going down on the prophets and the ending of the drought of the word of, uh, of the water of the word of God. We're still in this period of God's silence. Sisters have the unique opportunity to be like God through this silence ritual. Now, there is nothing in my life that I want more than to be like my God and my King. It's the absolute, absolute focus of my life. But I am forbidden this particular manifestation of our Heavenly Father at this time. I'm required to not be silent, to teach, to act as an administrator. Brethren are mandated not to be silent. Like our God, this time in his plan. But sisters can manifest God in observing this silence ritual at this time. Disrespecting this ritual is to declare that God's silence is inappropriate, that it's wrong, that God is wrong. Do we remember the observation that we made about how sisters have a unique opportunity to be godlike by veiling their glory when they cover their heads during any prayer? There is a similar unique opportunity for sisters to exhibit a godlikeness that is exclusive to their gender in the silence ritual. Why would any sister want to miss that opportunity to be godlike by disrespecting? this ritual, presuming that the serpent principle of equality or the presumption of competence somehow trumps divine principles. Well, we, we still have a few issues to address. In relation to this sister's silence and audible responsibilities of brethren um, in this ecclesial age ritual, and we'll address those, those final thoughts in our next class. And, Perhaps we'll even have time to move on to our next theme in our pursuit of understanding God's righteousness. Mm -hmm.